Hey everyone, it's Tuesday, it's three o'clock. That means it's Tech Tuesday. Today I wanted to talk about a vulnerability that's in a couple of Cisco security appliances, ironically, that could provide access to your network if you happen to use those. Uh, so I wanna make sure everybody's aware of that, but also of some really important best practices that can go a long way, that are not hard to implement, that can go a long way toward protecting your network. Be right back. And thanks for joining me again. Rick Uzi here with Tech Tuesday today. So um, again, I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody was aware of this and talk a little bit about cybersecurity in general. So actually, let me go back to here. So as I'm talking about these things, I wanted to remind you kind of upfront um, that we can help here. Um, you know, uh, we have a managed security product service. It's basically a security operations center as a service. So it's the kind of thing where we can help get everything set up, uh, do a lot of the heavy lifting and uh, help you keep control and security on your network. And this is something that uh, if you're an internet service provider, broadband provider, it's very important not only to protect your own network, uh, to protect uh, your business. You're in the business, obviously, of connecting lots of people to the internet. And if you go down, they go down and that's not good for you. It's not good for your business. If your data, customer data gets out there, that's not good for your business and the trust your customers have. So those are important things, can really impact your bottom line. We can help there. So if you're a broadband operator, really any enterprise needs to be looking at these things. And also if you're a broadband operator and you're looking at getting a couple other things you need to be aware of. If you're looking at getting funding, especially for bead funding, because that is a requirement for the broadband equity access and deployment program, you need to have a cybersecurity plan in place uh, and you need to be able to attest that to the state that's gonna provide those funds to you, that you have that in place for you to get funding. I think uh, future federal funding programs will have um, cybersecurity requirements. And a lot of insurance companies now, you can't, you can't get insurance if you don't have cybersecurity in place, or it's a lot more expensive if you don't have cybersecurity in place. So these are things to keep in mind. So you see our contact information here. I also have it up at the end. Uh, so reach out to us. We can provide, um, again, cybersecurity services, including um, helping get you not just your uh, network equipment and those kinds of security measures in place, but also helping you determine where your weaknesses are. And this might be one of the, some of the more important things, which we'll see here as we talk about this. So uh, again, here's the article. Um, uh, this is an Ars Technica. I linked to this as well as a couple other things in the description. So you see here, uh, Cisco uh, Security Appliance Zero Day is under attack by ransomware crooks. And Zero Day is basically that's where Somebody's attacking something, zero day meaning there's no protection against it. So somebody determines or discovers that there's this vulnerability and people are able to attack it because there's nothing to prevent them from doing that. And a lot of times there's not any workarounds. In this case, Cisco's come out with some workarounds, but I don't believe they have yet patched the code for these particular devices or these appliances. So uh, I'll just read through some of this. And then I also wanted to talk about the... Um, MGM Grand ransomware attack and some things that we can learn from that as well. So I'll cover that today. So you see here, uh, Cisco on Thursday confirmed the existence of a currently unpatched zero-day vulnerability that hackers are exploiting to gain unauthorized access to two widely used security appliances it sells. The vul vulnerability resides in Cisco's adaptive security appliance software and its firepower threat defense, which are typically abbreviated ASA and FTD. Cisco and researchers have known since last week, and this, this story was back on September 8th, so we're here several weeks into this now. Um, so uh, again, where was I? Uh, Cisco and researchers have known since last week that a ransomware crime syndicate called Akira was gaining access to devices through password spraying and brute forcing. Password spraying is also known as credential stuffing involving trying or involves trying a handful of commonly used passwords for a large number of of usernames in an attempt to prevent detection and subsequent lockouts. In brute force attacks, hackers use much larger corpus of password guesses against a more limited number of circumstances. And first thing to learn here is that um, these brute force attacks can, attacks can be very effective if there's nothing that is limiting the number of tries that somebody can attempt. And that's one of the issues here, I believe, is that somebody can go in and attempt lots of different login and password combinations and unfortunately, quite often, weak passwords are a problem. So a lot of times people think, oh, you know, seven characters are okay, and I'll throw a number in there and maybe a capital letter. And that's 
certainly more secure than password as your password, but um, these dictionary attacks and other kinds of brute force attacks is they can go through lots of combinations of things, lots of common things and unusual things sometimes. And um, you need, you really need longer passwords these days and more more variants in there, more, you know, some capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. And, you know, sometimes they got to be really ugly passwords, unfortunately, the kind of thing that it's like, you'll never remember it, but it's, you know, depending on, on what you're protecting, uh, the more secure that password needs to be. And if you're protecting kind of the, the network and everything that's on it, those need to be really, really secure. You know, if it's your, um, if it's you're just logging into something and it's not really that important, if somebody were to hack into it, maybe you can find something a little bit easier to remember. Um, let's see here. So ongoing attacks since at least March. So this is going back a while. Uh, I think, you know, not discovered maybe till recently, but an attacker could exploit this vulnerability by specifying a default connection profile tunnel group while conducting a brute force attack or while establishing a clientless SSL VPN session using valid credentials or a virtual private network. Cisco officials wrote in an advisory, a success, oh, that's what they wrote in advisory. A successful exploit could allow the attacker to achieve one or both of the following. Identify valid credentials that could then be used to establish an unauthorized remote access VPN session or establish a clientless SSL VPN session only when running Cisco ASA software release 9.16 or earlier. So another thing to learn is make sure that whatever you have out there is got uh, the most up-to-date code or maybe something close to most up-to-date. A lot of times people don't like to do the very most up-to-date because they could introduce bugs or issues. Sometimes you want you want the most stable version, but don't go, don't be too far back or some of these vulnerabilities can, can creep in here. And VPN access, this is really serious. So this is, this is basically like opening the, if somebody gets access, it's like the door is open onto your network and they can go, then go into your network. And depending on the credentials or the uh, the uh, abilities that that person has uh, on, on the network, whatever their credentials are, allow them to do, then that person can do it, which can be locking down data, stealing data, doing all kinds of things. So uh, this VPN stuff's kind of scary. Uh, the ASA is an all-in-one security device that provides firewall, antivirus, intrusion prevention. Pretty ironic, isn't it? and virtual private network protections, also ironic. Um, the FTD is Cisco's next generation device that combines the ASA capabilities with a finer grain management console and other more advanced features. So this is kind of do it yourself uh, security and you can certainly do that. You can put this equipment or these appliances in there, but you need to be aware that you know, this kind of thing can happen. And then more importantly, um, you know, it helps you have to have people kind of keeping track of these things and, and managing them. It's just, uh, you know, security is not just drop it in and hope it works, which is why on the service that we provide, we have people that are monitoring these things 24 um, seven. They're monitoring the agents that are installed. They're looking and those, those agents are looking for unusual behavior, those kinds of things. So uh, you really need, you know, depending again, what you're protecting, you really need to maybe amp up your protection and not just drop in something that you're going to, it's not, set it and forget it, uh, security. The vulnerability tracked as uh, stems from devices, improper separation of authentication, authorization, and accounting and remote access among their VPN, HTTPS management, and site-to-site -site VPN features. Site-to-site -site means maybe um, getting access to more than one site. It has a severity rating of five out of a possible 10. So they're calling this a medium risk and uh, it sounds more me more than medium to me but it may be that they've got to work around and there's some things that can help mitigate it um, so this uh, AAA AAA authentication authorization and accounting that's basically what is used to authenticate a user so you've got a username and a password and that's somebody when they go to authenticate or log in you're checking this database of username and password the authorization you get authorized on the network and then the accounting is, okay, somebody logged in, what time did they log in? You got through logs, that kind of thing. So that's, that's what's uh, vulnerable there. Uh, researchers from security firm Rapid7 reported last week that they had observed credential stuffing and brute force attacks against ASA devices since at least last March. So I guess they've noticed it since then. It was only reported though uh, earlier this month. Rapid7 Rapid identified at least 11 customers who experienced Cisco ASA-related intrusions between March 30th and August 24th. I'm uh, going to skip some of this. Uh, in most of the incidents, we investigated threat actors attempted to log into ASA appliances with a common set of usernames, including 
you can see some of these. So these are, you know, you've got your password and you've got your username. So if your username is something fairly common, that just makes it a little bit easier for somebody to hack the account because they, they can then brute force the password. It can help to have a username or usernames that are not um, that standard kind of thing. So here you got admin, right? Or admin admin, backup admin. Uh, I don't know what Kelly is. I don't know why that would be something that would be used. Maybe that's something I'm not aware of. Or it could just been a, somebody knew that. Uh, Cisco, obviously that's the bad one. That's a bad one. Guest is bad. Um, I mean, if you want to use guest, use guest and then a couple of numbers, something like that to make it a little better. Accounting, developer, FTP user, training, test, printer, echo, security, inspector, test, test, and SNMP. So these are, again, all things you see here. The above is a fairly standard list of accounts that may point at use of a brute forcing tool. So again, they have the brute force tool. They're trying things like admin or admin, admin, or security, and then they're throwing passwords in there, and they can go through these things rapidly. Uh, several of the intrusions culminated in the deployment and execution of Akira or LockBit related ransomware binaries. So again, uh, this, this is one way for people to get access to your network and then lock it down and you've got a ransomware situation where suddenly you can't get to your data and they're not going to give it back to you. Or um, if you back it up and they maybe then publish that data, depending on what it is. Researchers went on to report a guide on breaking into corporate accounts and advertised for sale in crime forms. So this is big business. So once somebody uh, figures out this thing, they then leverage it and they go ahead and publish that to other criminals and they sell that and they make a little nice hacking kit. Uh, so again, it just increases the, the level of this kind of thing happening because then suddenly you've got these script kitties out there that don't need to know anything about how to make this work or how to figure this out. So you got the people who figure it out, then they sell the knowledge to other people and like in a little nice wrapped up with a bow around it way for them to go in and then do this to other folks. Uh, the seller claimed to have compromised 4,865 Cisco SSL VPN services and 9,870 Fortinet VPN services using username password combination test test. Wow, that's pretty insecure, right? The Rapid7 report was published five days after a principal engineer on Cisco's product security incident response team warned customers that the company was aware of credential attacks on ASAs. He advised customers to use strong passwords, yes, and enforce MFA for all users. That's multi-factor access, or excuse me, multi-factor authentication. So it's kind of annoying, uh, but multi-factor authentication, that's when you want to log into something like your account and you put in your password and it says, okay, we're going to text you. And you need to confirm that, or we're going to send you a Google Authy code or something like that, an Authy code or Google Authenticator. Um, and again, it's a little bit annoying, but depending on what you're protecting, that is a way that you can significantly reduce the likelihood that you will get hacked or that your uh, employees' network will get hacked because they don't just need your password, they need that extra step and they don't have access to that. So that is important, unless they somehow hack your or get control of your phone and can get your texts uh, or if you send stuff via email they've got access to that so there's different things you can do but that's obviously multi-factor authentication is important uh, and again the strong password is very important strong passwords will help your password from getting cracked and then the multi-factor authentication will then even if it does get hacked or cracked then uh, that will help prevent somebody from using that it's currently unknown when a patch will be released uh, and I think, again, it's still not released as far as I could tell. Cisco's Thursday advisory, that was back when, said that in addition to the above guidance regarding passwords and MFA, customers can take the following step to protect themselves from the ongoing attacks. I've got here, configure a dynamic access policy to terminate VPN tunnel establishment when the default admin group or default uh, 2L group connection profile tunnel group is used. So those are a couple different groups that's saying that you should not allow that VPN tunnel to be established. Deny remote access VPN using the default group policy control. Restrict users and the local user database. Um, and obviously that, you know, that's another um, thing that any, any, every company should do is you need to make sure that only those people that need access to really sensitive things like that can, you know, get a hold of your data, do those kinds of things that there's a limited number of people that have that. And then I was talking about strong passwords, also passwords that don't stay the same. Um, you know, because again, the longer they're out there, sometimes the, the more 
vulnerable they are and you have people leave. Uh, when people leave, you need to consider the fact that somebody's gone who may have had access to your uh, key passwords, those kinds of things. Um, lock users to a specific connection profile tunnel group only. That's part of that restricting their access. Prevent users from establishing remote access VPN sessions. So um, just if users don't need that access, restrict that. The most effective protection, however, remains strict enforcement of MFA or the multi-factor authentication since the requirement will prevent access even when an attacker has possession of the correct username password combination. So again, that's very important to have that multi-factor authentication in there. So again, I've linked to this. Um, this is uh, the security. I also linked to this. This is the Cisco Security Advisory, so you could get an update on here, I guess, when they get the patch out, if you are using this equipment. Um, that's right there. Um, and then this is what we're, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So again, this is an appliance that you can get from Cisco that it, you drop in. It's not, as far as I know, managed by them or looked at by them. It's the kind of thing where you can put it in, and there's, I'm sure there's some default configurations firewall kinds of stuff that will help protect your network, but that may not be enough um, depending on what you're doing. And again, as, a, as an internet service provider, I don't think that's enough. I think you need something a little bit better, more active protection. If you're a bank, if you're folks like that, I think you need more active protection where again, some, folks like us can get everything set up for you. And it's not just one appliance, okay? It's agents on different uh, endpoints and it's actively monitored. It's looking for behavior. It's not just looking for uh, known vulnerabilities. It's also looking for behavior that could indicate that something's going on. And what you what you get by that is the sooner that you can identify these things, if you um, if you find that again, you know, if you can have something go on in your network for a month and you might not know it, and while that's going on, you could have folks in there prodding around, grabbing data, copying data, figuring out what's vulnerable, and then. All at once, then you you find out you've got a ransomware attack, but it's been going on for a month. So if you have someone monitoring this in place, looking for odd behavior, and you can catch that sooner, then you can get that data protected and locked down before anything happens, before that uh, that can spread throughout your network as people are looking for those vulnerabilities and what they can what they can get a hold of. So that's very important. I wanted to talk about this uh, this attack here also. So this is in Vox. So. This was just, uh, this is very recent. The chaotic and cinematic MGM casino hack explained. So uh, this, again, is a very recent attack that MGM has been talking about, or as it's, I should say it's in the news. Um, did prominent casino chain MGM Resorts gamble with its customers' data? That is a question a lot of customers are probably asking themselves now, a week into a cyber attack that took down many of MGM's systems, and it may have all started with a phone call if reports citing the hackers themselves should be, are to be believed. So this is going to point out another vulnerability. Uh, we, you know, I talked about how you can have some, you know, you can have bad passwords and you can have a piece of equipment that is bad, uh, that has a vulnerability. And, you know, you've got a, you know, you've got, that's an, that's a potential vector that you've got, but then you've got employees that are potential vectors. And that's what this is really related to. So MGM, which owns more than two dozen hotel and casino locations around the world, as well as an online sports betting arm, reported on September 11th uh, that a cybersecurity issue was affecting some of its systems, which it shut down to protect our, which it shut down to protect our systems and data. For the next several days, reports that everything from hotel room digital keys to slot machines weren't weren't working. Even websites for its many properties went offline for a while. Guests found themselves waiting an hour long hours long lines to check in and get physical room keys we're getting handwritten receipts for casino winnings as the company went into manual mode to stay as operational as possible so right here you can see how this is impacting many aspects of this business so when this kind of stuff happens it really can take a toll on your business again both you know it's bad bad press um Bad, uh, it looks bad for your reputation uh, as far as your customers go. Your customers, if they happen to be there and they're waiting in long lines, they're not happy. Uh, so it's very important to uh, have protections in place to prevent this. The attacks show how even organizations that you might expect to be especially locked down and protected from cybersecurity attacks, say a massive camino, casino chains that pull in tens of million dollars every day, are still vulnerable if the hacker uses the right attack vector. And you do think of casinos being very secure because they are from the standpoint of physically, right? I mean, they've got cameras in the ceilings everywhere, eyes in the sky looking down, making sure nobody's cheating and stealing. Um, I'm sure they've got, uh, you know, 
money that's stored and very secure, those kinds of things. But the online world is totally different. Uh, in this case, it appears that a publicly available that publicly available information in a persuasive phone manner were enough to give the hackers all they needed to get into MGM systems and create what is likely to be some very expensive havoc that will be that will hurt both the resort chain and many of its guests. So again, bad reputation here that they're cultivating from this. A group known as Scattered Spider is believed to be responsible for the MGM breach and has reportedly used ransomware made by Alpha Alpha V. I mean, it's Alf V or Black Cat, a ransomware as a service operation. So again, this is another one of these things where you've, you know, you've got people that create this ransomware kinds of software and they sell it. And then all you need to do uh, maybe is have some social engineering expertise and then you can use this uh, ransomware as a service to uh, attack whoever you want. We provide uh, security operations center as a service. So you need us to counter the ransomware as a service kinds of things. Scattered Spider specializes in social engineering where attackers manipulate victims and perform into performing certain actions by impersonating people or organizations the victim has a relationship with. So it's basically uh, phone con men is what, what they are, is they're, you know, they'll pick up the phone and con somebody into giving up important and key information. The hackers are said to be especially good at vishing or gaining access to systems through a con convincing phone call rather than phishing which is done through an email. So phishing has been very common. You know, you get that email and sometimes they're really easy to recognize because they're, you know, if, if it's, uh, you know, if you're in the United States and you're looking at the English and it's not good English, it's not written well, you can sometimes tell, you can look at the link. Maybe it's trying to link you off somewhere and you look and you go, wait a minute, what's that URL? That's not what it says it's supposed to be. So if you have any sense at all, hopefully, if, or I should say experience, and you've been looking at these kinds of things, you can usually identify those. Sometimes they look more real than other times. Sometimes the logo's in the right place. The English looks good. Um, it looks so good that maybe you don't think about it. Don't give it a second thought on click on something. So that can happen to anybody. But um, the emails, you know, sometimes you can identify them a little bit easier. Uh, in this case, it appears that the hackers found an employee's information on LinkedIn and impersonated them in a call to MGM's IT help desk to obtain credential, credentials to access and infect the systems. So. Right there, you've got uh, somebody was not properly trained. Maybe nobody was properly trained on the uh, IT help desk there because that's the kind of thing that should not happen. And this goes to show you that you can have really good, um, let's say, physical security on your network. You can have the intrusion detection and all kinds of things in there, but here's your weak link right here. Uh, you still need the intrusion detection because that can, again, help identify that somebody's in the network sooner and maybe mitigate some of that impact they can have. But right here, doesn't matter what kind of security you've got in place, if an employee is going to hand out, whether purposely or in this case, mistakenly, give somebody a username and password into the system. Someone claiming to be a representative of Scattered Spider told, and that's funny, it's interesting that Scattered Spider is talking to the press, but somebody that claimed to be a rep representative of that group told the Financial Times that it stole and encrypted MGM's data and is demanding a payment in crypto to release it. This was the backup plan. The group initially planned to hack the company's slot machines, but weren't able to, the representative claimed. Um, so one of the things that um, companies started doing is saying, oh, well, you know, we'll just back up our data. So that way, if somebody locks us out of our data, we'll have a backup, we'll get a backup every day, and we'll store that off site. And if that happens, won't be connected to our network, then we'll just be able to restore that. Well, that is a that is a good thing to do. However, what the tactic that a lot of these uh, folks are doing now, now that they realize companies maybe have a copy of their data, is they're saying we will release that data out on the dark web or out on the internet, public internet, and you know it could be all of your customer data, credit card information, addresses, uh, maybe sensitive medical information, bank account numbers, all this stuff. They could just release it out there. So sometimes the ransom is. Uh, if you want your data back, pay us a ransom. And if you say, well, we've already got a data, go away. They might say, okay, we'll just release it out on the web. Uh, so you've got to be aware that that is a common tap tactic now. Uh, Alf V Black Cat is denying parts of these reports. So again, um, the uh, group, um, what's the name? Oh, a Scattered Spider. So the group Scattered Spider, they're kind of, they're the, uh, they're the, the vishing people, right? They're the vishing experts, social engineering experts, whereas Alpha V and Black Cat are the uh, ransomware as a service folks. So they've got the platform 
that uh, Scattered Spider used or uses to then go ahead and do the ransomware stuff. Uh, but Alpha, Alpha V Black Cat is denying the reports of uh, Scattered Spider, <laughs> especially the slot machine hacking attempt. The group posted a message on September 14 claiming responsibility for the attack, but denying that it was perpetrated by teenagers in the U.S. and Europe or that anyone tried to tamper with slot machines. It also criticized what it said was inaccurate reporting on the hack and said it hadn't officially spoken to anyone about the hack and most likely wouldn't in the future. The message said that data was stolen from MGM, which has thus far refused to engage with the hackers or pay any kind of ransom. It seems that MGM wasn't the only casino chain hit by a recent cyber attack. Caesars Entertainment paid millions of dollars to hackers who breached its systems around the same time as MGM and was able to continue operations as normal. So here you've got two stories. So you've got MGM, they haven't paid a ransom and they were able to get operational, had a lot of uh, kind of chaos in the process, but they were able to get operational. And you've got um, Caesars who I guess didn't want to, couldn't get operational or didn't want to hassle with it. And they paid millions of dollars. Of course, they make lots of money, I'm sure, as a, as a casino, but just imagine that. You can see why this is big business and why these uh, these groups will sell the, ransomware as a service, and then we'll perform the, the uh, other kinds of things that, that uh, this other, these phishing experts are doing. It's, there's a lot of money in it. Caesars admitted to the breach in a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission on September 14th, where it said an outsourced IC, IT support vendor was the victim of a social engineering attack that resulted in sensitive data about members of its customer loyalty program being stolen. Um, so there, that's what was stolen was members of customer loyalty program. So that could have just been names and addresses and phone numbers and maybe maybe some kind of account number. Um, and they paid millions of dollars to keep that from, to get the, either get that back or keep it from being published. Now, here it's showing you something else that's very important in cybersecurity. And this is also something that is required in the BEAD cybersecurity requirements, uh, broadband equity access and deployment funding that is coming soon. Um, you need to not only protect your own network, but you need to also make sure that your supply chain is protected. So in other words, if you have an IT, uh, if you're doing outsourced IT, somebody's doing that for you, you need to make sure that they've got systems in place to protect against that. And that would be the physical kinds of systems that protect, but also training for employees so that they do not give away information that is then going to compromise your network. And that's what happened here. They have an outsourced IT support vendor that um, basically, you know, that is what got compromised and that allowed the Caesars network to be compromised. I think there's going to be some kind of a lawsuit there. I'm, I'm just guessing. I did not hear that, but I would imagine so. But if I had to pay millions of dollars and it was an IT company that did that, that I would want them to be on the hook for some of that, if not all of that. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here. So why vishing works? So obviously it's a portmanteau of voice and phishing or vishing. Like all so social engineering techniques, it targets what's usually the weakest link in the cybersecurity chain, us, meaning just people. More than 90% of cyber attacks start with phishing, and it's one of the most common ways that organizations are penetrated as well. So that would be the email phishing. So that's, that's easy from the standpoint of you, you write the email, and then you launch it to a bunch of people, and you hope somebody responds, right? That's, that's why that's easy. Uh, phishing is particularly effective and a particularly effective avenue of attack, a 2022 IBM report found that targeted phishing attacks that included phone calls were three times more effective than those that didn't. And that's because they're targeted. Again, you can just throw a bunch of emails out there and a lot of people ignore them, don't open them. You'll get a few hits, but you can really do that in mass. But the vishing thing where you've actually got somebody on the phone and they, you got to learn about the company and you're trying to convince somebody that takes a lot more work, but it's more effective because you're you're really talking to somebody and then you have an opportunity to really, really uh, get into that organization. If you can make them believe you are who you say you are. Ransomware attacks aren't unusual these days. They've shut down major gas pipelines, banks, hospitals, schools, meat producers, governments, and journalism outlets. At this point, you'd be hard-pressed to find an industry or sector that hasn't been hit by a ransomware attack. Vishing, on the other hand, is a, is a method that hasn't gotten nearly as much attention yet, but we may well see a lot more. And again, I think the reason it hasn't got, gotten as much attention is because it, it takes time. You've got to learn the company. Um, you've got to have somebody that can be convincing and kind of your little actor person, your talent, so to speak, to be on the phone and talk with folks and convince them about 
you know, who they are. So it's not quite as easy as sending out a bunch of phishing emails. What we're seeing, especially in the new age of artificial intelligence, is the attackers, attackers are leveraging not only hacked information that they find out about you, but also all of your social profile information, Nicoletti said, uh, quote there. So, and that is artificial intelligence, um, something like chat GPD, you know, it can go out there and scour all kinds of information and build a story and really pretty much write the script uh, for what the person on the phone is going to be saying, because it's going to be looking at all of this kind of information. So it, this artificial in in intelligence makes it even more important for us to be on our A game when we are talking to people on the phone or looking at emails, because it's going to get more, it's going to be, get harder and harder to determine what's real and what's not. And at some point in the near future, hopefully I will be out of this business and um, we'll just be disconnected from everything. In the near future, who knows, you might get something that looks like a video call from your CEO and it sure looks like your CEO and it sure looks like they're telling you, hey, I need the login and password for this network. Uh, I can't get on. Uh, you need to help me. And then suddenly you wind up giving it to them because it looked just like them, but it's really AI. It's deep fake video. That all could be coming in the future. So hopefully uh, there will be ways to for security companies to recognize those things and and to put that in place. It's kind of like spy versus cop. You know, this is never ending um, kind of back and forth on these things. So it's scary how how this is going to be in the future. Stephanie Carruthers, who is a chief people hacker for IBM, uses social engineering to test client organization systems to find potential vulnerabilities. That includes vishing, which gives her a front row seat on how it can be used to gain access to a target. And that's a good thing to do. It could, you could do that within your own company and set up uh, tests for people, you know, um, kind of like, uh, what was that old thing that people, uh, people used to do? Uh, secret secret shoppers, you know, like you might um, have a secret shopper who calls your sales group and make sure that salespeople are being polite, that they're saying the right things on the phone, that they're trying to close the deal, those kinds of things. Well, this could be a secret hacker kind of program where you're just trying, or Visher program where you're trying to see if you can get employees to give up information that they shouldn't be giving up. And you don't want to punish them. You want to train them if it turns out that they did, right? Because they, they need to know. And by the way, what we will do uh, what our team does uh, when we engage on a uh, cybersecurity kinds of thing is uh, part of what we do is look for what your vulnerabilities are and kind of make sure you understand the kind of training that employees need to have because employees, again, are a vector and a very common one used and the weakest link. So you want to make sure that employees are trained on what to do, what not to do, those kinds of things. So uh, these are all good ideas. Uh, from the another attack, from the attacker point of view, phishing is easy, she told Vox. With phishing, I have to set up infrastructure, I have to craft an email and do all these extra technical things. But with phishing, it's picking up the phone and calling someone and asking for a password reset. It's pretty simple. Pretty simple, yes. But again, uh, you, I think there's, you know, if I think there's more research involved. Now, if she's doing this for companies, she's she's doing it. She's researching the company, so she's putting a lot of work into it. She's not just picking up the phone and calling some company and saying, hi, my name's Sally. Can you give me a login and password? She has to research these companies, so it is actually quite a bit of work to do that. Um, one of the keys to a successful vishing attack is knowing enough about a system company, about a system, company, or employee to pull off the impersonation. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. You need research. You can learn about a lot about people and organizations just from what's publicly available, including who companies' high-value targets are. So um, again, you might be uh, vishing to get into that IT, um, that outsourced IT company. And then from there, you can get access to lots of other companies because you've got access to a IT company that then has access to the networks of lots of other companies. So that is a common tactic. Makes the job of an attacker so much easier, Carruthers said. Things like LinkedIn and different types of people, search engines, that is the first step to making a successful vish. From there, the attacker can use other social engineering techniques like adding a sense of authority or urgency to a request. Organizations with inadequate verification processes to prove that the caller is who they claim to be are especially vulnerable. It's something we see happen all the time. So again, you need those checks in place. Make sure that person can prove who they are. So what can you do to protect yourself when it comes to attempts to vish you personally, the same general rules about being careful what information you share and with whom you apply? Let me read that again. Uh, the same general rules about being careful what information you share and with whom apply. Uh, so 
Yeah. So as you as you read an email and you go, is this real? This doesn't look real. You want to you want to have the same attitude when somebody calls you and they're asking for anything that um, is uh, personal information, uh, your login or password information, or some kind of IP address for some kind of server, this or that. You want to make sure you know who you're talking to. Really make sure. And you don't want to give that information out. Uh, you want to have certain policies where you don't give that information out uh, over the phone, those kinds of things. So. Um, again, that needs to be in place. Don't give out your login credentials and passwords and be careful about your publicly available data as well, since attacks may use it against you or to impersonate you to trick someone else. So you got to be careful about what you put out on your social networks um, or just in public. Verify that people are who they claim to be before engaging with them. Use different passwords across all of your accounts. So if someone gets access to one of them, they aren't then able to get into others and use multi-factor authentication for another layer of protection. We talked about that from the other story, have that multi-factor authentication. And yeah, what when you're just for your own personal security, um, don't use the same password all over the place. Um, you know, Yahoo, for example, I think was hacked a few years ago, maybe many, many years ago. It all seems to, time is flying, right? But I think Yahoo was hacked, and then a lot of people had this their Yahoo password the same as their bank password, the same as uh, their email password, you know, other other kinds of passwords. And, uh, and then suddenly, if that was out there and somebody knew who the user was, they can then go try that same password on lots of other things. So you want to make sure you have a different password for everything, except for those things you don't care about. You can have the same password if somebody hacks one or more of them, you don't care. And maybe they'll think that's your password for everything else, and it's not. So I would say. Um, you know, the really important things, anything that's at all important, you need to have a, a different password. In, in this case, however, there's not much people can do when a company they trusted with their data didn't have sufficient systems in place to protect it, which a lot of them don't. And what's, it's talking about two things there, I think. They're talking about you as a consumer, let's say. There's nothing you can do when you're an MGM customer, MGM grand customer, and suddenly your data is out there because they didn't protect it. But also, like I say, you need to make sure um, if you are a company that your supply chain partners that have access to date your data have protections in place or that have access to your network have protections in place that, uh, that will protect you or keep you protected. So that's very important. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so again, I got a link to this and the other stuff in uh, the description of the video there. So uh, very important to take this into account. And again, if you at all are concerned about cybersecurity, reach out to us. You see our phone number, our email address, our web address. Go to our website, look for cybersecurity, brand name Cyber Zcurity for Z Quorum, right? Check that out and you'll see all the services that we can offer there. And a lot of that, again, does have to do with not just, not just the equipment and the software to protect your network, but making sure that you have everything in place as far as training, what you need to tell your employees, policies you need to have in place, how things are protected. Again, making sure that You've got password policies in place, uh, maybe rotating those or making those, uh, we have to be reset every so often, those kinds of things. All are uh, well-known best practices for security, so you need to take those things into account. If you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button, not right there where you see the little hand moving, that's not going to work, but click down on the video somewhere and you'll see the subscriber under the video. Click that, ring the bell to be notified when I'm live and you'll be notified if I'm on Tuesday for Tech Tuesday, or pretty much every day. Otherwise, for broadband deployment news, I am posting a live video. Not posting, I guess. I'm streaming a live video. So I uh, hope you would do that. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I'd appreciate that. And otherwise, I will see you next time. I'll see you tomorrow for broadband deployment news. Take care. Bye-bye.